Hey everyone, it's Matt over here at Lima Charlie. Thank you so much for joining me today. It is great to have everyone here. I am going to let uh, give us a moment to let some folks kind of filter in here. Uh, we've got a good number registered for today's webinar, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to, to jump in and see some of the content we'll be talking about. I think while we're waiting for folks to kind of fill into the room here, uh, I, I first want to start out by saying that I want to be able to put together more of these types of responsive webinars for folks because this one is directly in response to a joint advisory that came out of a bunch of different government organizations that we'll, we're going to talk about in just a moment here. But more important, I want to be able to continue to demonstrate how folks out there can find value in detecting adversarial activity using Lima Charlie. Uh, it is definitely an interesting onset when you say, I'm going to get into the process of writing and crafting my my own detections. Uh, I'm going to get into the process of, you know, what does this look like? Hey, how do I write this? How do I monitor for that? How do I go through these different steps and whatnot? And that's one of the things that we're going to walk through today is what does it take? What does it take in order for me to put together and craft and write my own detections in Lima Charlie? Where do I begin? What type of activity should I be looking for? Like, what's my starting point? The reason why this is a very valuable exercise for everyone to perform, especially folks who are maybe thinking like, I want a little bit more out of my EDR capabilities. I want a little bit more out of my detection engineering capabilities. This exercise is going to be one that's going to be very valuable because you can also test it almost immediately inside of your environment to see you know, does this work? Am, am I able to see and observe this? So it's great to have everyone here today. I think we've got enough time for, for folks to filter in now. Uh, welcome to It's No Laughing Matter, Detecting Living Off the Land Binaries with, uh, with, with Lima Charlie. And, and I'm looking forward to getting started today. So just a quick note for folks as we go through this, I always like to, and those of you who have seen my webinars before, you know, I always like to give you some sort of logistics as to where I'm at. Uh, my camera's here, my monitor's over there. So if you see me kind of looking over to my left quite a bit, it's only because I'm watching the screen or I'm going through and writing out the commands and the things that we're looking for and whatnot. Uh, I promise you, I'm also keeping an eye on the chat window. So as we go through this webinar, I, I definitely recommend if you have questions, if you're concerned about something that I've brought up here, or you're kind of like, wait, Matt, why this, why that? Uh, let me know, ask those questions out loud and I'll happily answer to them. I, I want this to be as interactive as you'd like it to be. But while we're here and getting started, let me go ahead and, and bring up what I think is gonna be kind of some of the most important content for us to get into today. Ah, we've, we've got someone who's looking forward to the webinar. I am also looking forward to this as well. So this webinar, it is uh, February 27th today and exactly 20 days ago, and I'm glad I was able to say that because I know the date on here, exactly 20 days ago, the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency or, or CISA came out with a really cool publication. It wasn't necessarily authored by them. It was co-authored by them, but it was a joint guidance across multiple organizations, multiple agencies around the world. That's an important one about uh, identifying and mitigating living off the land techniques. Now, I, I need to spend just a moment and talking about what these are only because I want to set the, the stage. I want to set the foundation so everyone understands why it's important to understand what these living off the land techniques are. They're also sometimes shorthand referred to as LOLs, living off the land. You can see in here that CISA has provided the acronym of LOTL. I'm guessing to get away from the LOL, but regardless, it's important to understand why this is an acronym worth knowing, especially if you're in the detection engineering space. So living off the land binaries or, or the use of living off the land tools. And let me be clear, it's not just binaries. There, there's, there's plenty others that are out there as well. But living off the land is referring to when an adversary gains a foothold in a system or in an environment. And rather than utilize their own malware or bring down their own files, they're going to take advantage of files, processes, capabilities that are already built into the operating system that they've that they've broken into or that they've gotten a foothold on now because of the way the enterprise and computing world works when a lot of folks hear this they think windows 
And that is true. There is a definitely a larger market share on the Windows side. However, living off the land extends not just to Windows. It's also extended to Linux, to Mac. It's not just binaries. It's drivers. It's other capabilities. You could also go as far as to say, and this one tends to be a little bit of a point of contention, but it could certainly be there, that utilizing the built-in scripting languages could also be considered a form of living off the land as well. Regardless, what that does is that changes the game a little bit from a detection perspective. The biggest change that's going to be there is I have an adversary who's no longer bringing in their own custom binaries or their own custom code. They're utilizing something that's already on the system. So let's back up and let's talk about the security implication of what that means. First off, it's really easy to deploy some sort of endpoint protection software or tool and say, hey, I want you to watch out for all pieces of malware that get dropped on the system. Well, a binary that's included with the operating system is not going to be necessarily considered a piece of malware. It is how the tool is being used that makes it malicious. And it still itself is not malware. It's being used for a malicious purpose. So there's a baseline of, of detection, a baseline of endpoint protection that, that gets evaded there. Sometimes, for those folks out there who might not know kind of the underlying this, sometimes endpoint protection is wrapped in things like, is it signed? Is it signed by a legitimate company or authority? Do I recognize who this is? Can I validate this piece of software? There's all sorts of information that's, or I should say, there's all sorts of decision that's baked around the metadata of a particular binary or, or executable or file. And if I have a trusted part of the operating system being used maliciously, again, it also evades a lot of those checks. So, or I should say it passes those checks, therefore it evades that type of detection. So the baseline of living off the land is it can evade a lot of typical you know, endpoint security tools. There's another really unique part. If you take the adversarial point of view, there's another unique part that living off the land provides, which is it's likely going to be there as well. If I'm an attacker breaking into or breaking onto a system, I don't want to have a separate playbook depending on which operating system version I'm going to land in. Uh oh, am I going to land into Windows 7, Windows 10, Windows 11, Server 2012, Server 2016? Uh, which distribution of Linux am I going to run into? Is it Mac OS X 10 point whatever? There's a lot of decisions that have to go into that that could impact your custom software development. And I, I was that's the important part here is there are lots of pieces of malware out there that work very well in Windows 7 or early versions of Windows 10. They don't work very well in later, later, latter versions of Windows 10 or Windows 11. There's, for the longest time, and I'm definitely dating myself here, but for the longest time, a lot of malware sandboxes were XP and Windows 7, just because, okay, the thing's gonna detonate in there, right? And not to get too far down the malware road, but if I'm an adversary and I no longer have to account for my own software development, all I need to do is gain a foothold and then I'm in and then I can roll in and I can utilize a bunch of living off the land tools. We're going to be in business. It's going to be a lot easier. So saying all of that with this joint guidance in the background, let's actually pull this up and, and talk a little bit about kind of the, the validity and the significance of this here. One of the important things to note about this is, first off, whenever I see a joint guidance from essentially the uh, you know the, the the Five Eyes folks or the cooperative efforts of multiple different governments together, I'm pretty happy to say this is probably something that they all want everybody to know about. Number one, number two. I'm super happy to see some of the particular U.S. agencies getting involved in this because it's not every day you get to read a combined security advisory involving the EPA or involving the uh, involving the DOE. And I'm not you know, a little bit tongue in cheek there, but at the same time, I love it when we get support from the federal space that gets shared out publicly and gives folks, hey, here's some things you need to watch out for. I definitely recommend checking out this report. They do go into an important step here is understanding the threat actors that utilize these types of tools. We in this webinar are not going to go down that road. I'm just going to tell you right now, we are not going to go down the road of, oh, here's how to stop the Russians in doing a thing, or here's how to stop a Chinese nexus th state threat actor. We're not doing that. We're here to focus specifically on the techniques, on the ways that adversaries do what they do. 
However, if you are someone who is in the threat intelligence space and you're looking to maybe add a little bit of context to these detections that you might write, this is going to be an important step to say, ah, here's how this thing is being used. And of course, obviously, that's going to tell us how the threat actors do what they do. Number one, this is a very lengthy report a very lengthy report. There's lots of great insight into this right here. We are going to jump all the way to Appendix A. And by the way, over in the chat for our particular webinar here today, I'm going to post a link to this PDF and we're also gonna have it associated with the webinar over in our hosted platform and everything like that. However, I just wanna pick up on some of the great value that they've provided inside of this because it's one thing to make a joint guidance that says, hey, watch out for this thing. Here's a really brief example of how it works. And you're kind of done there. You're like, all right, well, that was, that was great. In other cases, I love seeing kind of the cross-platform support with actual commands, which is one thing that we're going to look at uh, right here and right now. So first off, inside of the joint release, they've talked about living off the land in Windows. We've got some examples of things that they've seen done in Windows. We've got Linux, things, examples of things they've seen in Linux. Mac OS, love seeing the representation of Mac OS there. And then within cloud environments as well. This is something that I think is worth its own webinar. Now, of course, they get into hybrid environments as well, which could be seen as a blend between the two. But I'm just going to say, let me pause on the cloud environments side of things for a moment here, because this is one that I don't know if a lot of folks will, will, will pick on, if a lot of folks will kind of, you know, think about when they think about living off the land is, oh yeah, uh, cloud environments definitely feature in because again, traditional detection engineering, when you think of living off the land has thought of binaries, drivers, files, an adversary and a command line running a thing. Well, there are components that are native to cloud environments that adversaries can take advantage of as well. Take a look at the second bullet point down. Let me zoom in on this one for folks here on the webinar. Second bullet point down, let me scroll over and see this here. It talks about achieving persistence through cloud automation services to maintain persistence in the environment by creating a trigger to do something whenever an event occurs. Think about the idea of living off the land, taking advantage or relying on something that is native to that particular environment and how are adversaries abusing that. And this is just an awesome, awesome vantage point, or I should say a viewpoint for folks to consider because it is taking advantage again of something native to that platform and then utilizing it for malicious purposes. I love seeing this representation in here. The last little piece that I'll mention before we talk about ways to go through and detect these is going to be the hybrid environments. Uh, one of the things that I was a huge fan of in going through this one is seeing the way that they talk about the misuse of cloud provider CLI tools. Now, I will go through and I will argue and say downloading a CLI tool to manage your AWS instance or your Azure instance is not necessarily living off the land because it is acquiring a third party binary to bring it into the environment and then utilizing that to modify or monitor or create or build or whatever it might be from a developer perspective. But I want you to take the viewpoint of an adversary. An adversary lands on a system. They land on a development system or a production system or a system that already has these tools built out in place. API keys already linked up. Credentials already provided, cached in memory, stored in there, whatever it might be, guess what? They are now living off the land. It's just that land belongs to a developer. That's an important distinction. It's an important distinction to make because living off the land is not only taking advantage of the things that are built into the platform in which they've gotten into, but it's also understanding that the land may change based on where you've gotten into and taking advantage of those setups as well. So with that said, I wanted to spend a little bit of time today, and I'm going to zoom out here because we're going to use these as, as some examples right here. I wanted to talk about Lima Charlie and how I would go through detecting and analyzing some of this activity inside of Lima Charlie. Now, one of the first things about this, by the way, I've got one of those clicky keyboards. So you're going to hear some of that sound in the background in case someone's like, what was that thing? 
When I talk about detecting this type of activity in Lima Charlie, one of my favorite starting points is when someone lists out a bunch of different platforms like this, Windows, Linux, Mac, hybrid, cloud, whatever, I'm super happy to say we got you covered in that aspect. Because with Lima Charlie, I've got cross-platform representation from an EDR perspective, full parity, Windows, Linux, and Mac, Chrome, and Docker, which we don't even cover in that advisory. But I can also bring in and interact with cloud sources if I want to as well, number one. Now, there's another really cool, important part of this, which is good to know, which is inside of Lima Charlie, I can also write, create, and customize my own detection and response rules. So I can take the most granular piece of information about the way a particular tool might be used, and I can look for that type of activity and write a detection rule for that type of activity. And the other cool thing about this is, if you notice inside of this particular lineup or this particular table here, the joint release has also gone through and provided us with a bunch of different MITRE attack IDs. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through what the MITRE attack matrix is. We're going to call that table stakes for this webinar, but I will post a link in the uh, in kind of the notes for this webinar for anyone who's curious about what that might be. But this is a really easy, quick cheat code inside of Lima Charlie to be able to detect this activity. So let's shift into Lima Charlie and let's hang here for just a moment because now I'm at the point from a security perspective where I've received this advisory. I understand what living off the land binaries are. I understand how they might be misused by adversaries. And I understand that I need to start finding ways to detect them. Well, one detection engineering approach would be, let me go here and start creating detection and response rules and I'm just going to start pivoting on executable names. This is a common approach in detection engineering is to focus on process events as your main source, your main feeder of information. I'm not saying that's bad. Process observation, enumeration, metadata gathering, capturing, so on and so forth is a very, very valuable place to start. However, we're going to see it's not the only place that you can go. Now, I started putting together some bits admin detection activity. I'll talk about what that is in, in just a moment here, or we'll look at that as a living off the land binary in just a moment. But if I'm going to be going through and detection and writing some detection rules and doing some detection engineering against this, and I'm in Lima, Charlie, I might not just start writing rules kind of just to see what happens. I'm going to go a different route. Now, I went ahead and set this up ahead of time, but over in our marketplace, you can actually go and turn on the Atomic Red Team. Awesome, awesome tool brought to us by the folks over at uh, Red Canary, over the, over the folks who build this out. And I'm going to say, wait a second, I've already got a link here. I've already got a MITRE attack ID that I can use to see what this looks like. And folks, when we write these detection and response rules, we are not going to just start writing, hoping to capture something. We're going to start with observed telemetry. We're going to start with observing how a particular thing looks in my environment. The benefit there is, first off, it may look the same in every other environment, very possible. But I'm more interested in, I want to know what it looks like kind of on the surface. I want to know what it looks like default. I want a simple basic test that will run this particular command for me. And one of the tools I'm gonna use in my detection engineering journey is going to be the Atomic Red Team. I'm gonna build it out. I've got a Windows 2016 server box that is running. We've got a Lima Charlie EDR sensor running on as well. So we've got full bi-directional capabilities with that particular box. And I'm gonna pick the first one. I'm gonna pick, uh, not the first one, but I'm gonna pick MSHTA 1218.005. We're gonna run a quick search across this one hopefully finding it in our list there. There we go. I'm going to select this as a test that we're going to run. For anyone curious, all of the tests are easily pre-populated in here. And as I'm going through my detection engineering journey, I want to run that one test. That's it. We've got a job ID associated with that, which means it's running in the background. I have not written a single detection and response rule. I want to start with telemetry. I want to start with understanding what that thing looks like inside of my particular environment. Now, one of the things that we've done with the recent release of Atomic Red Team is I can actually go and monitor the progress of this particular job as it's running. I can see what's happening 
as that job is being kicked off and what those events look like and what that status and what that feedback may look like for me as well. So we're going to let that job run in the background. And you can see I did a little bit of testing leading up to this. For tests that I've run in the past, I can look and see what did that telemetry look like? What did that test result look like? Did it run successfully? Were there any errors? Were there any issues or anything along those lines? And this makes my detection engineering journey really, really easy. But we're not interested in the test running. We're interested more in what the telemetry looks like. So for those of you who may not have seen the Lima Charlie timeline perspective before, I've got a very, very noisy one here for this particular Windows box. However, this is our Windows 2016 server, and I've got this thing turned up to 11, meaning I am capturing network connectivity. I am capturing Windows event logs. I'm capturing process events. I'm capturing all sorts of things happening inside of here. Again, my detection engineering journey is going to begin with observing telemetry. I want that viewpoint. I want to see everything that's happening. Whew, UDP is noisy over in this side. If I hop over to my live feed, I can see all the different types of events that are being generated. So we are going full blown on utilizing Lima Charlie for this. And I'm hoping if I hop back over to my timeline, we're going to start to see some events for that particular Atomic Red Team event that we were looking for there. While we're waiting, and not waiting for that to populate necessarily, but waiting for my browser window to go through and pull that up or to go through and kind of render that particular event, I'm going to pick on a couple of different types of events that we've got in here because I've got two matching events working together. So folks, I want to pick on this little block of activity that's happening right here. We've got one, two, three new process events being kicked off. And I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, interestingly, seven Windows event log entries all associated with the same, the same time frame, the same type of activity. So what I've got here is I've got evidence being represented in a couple of different ways. All right, let me zoom back up to where that was. There we go. I've got this evidence being represented in a couple of different ways. The new underscore process event is the native Lima Charlie event meaning this is the one that's being observed by the EDR sensor. The WEL event is the Windows event log event. Now, for anyone who might not know or might not be aware you can do this, I can task the EDR sensor with tapping into the Windows event log stream and marrying those events up. So as I'm going through and detecting these particular types of binaries, the more telemetry I can get, the better, because it's going to allow me to write higher fidelity rules. But to take a look, we've got a new process event here for WMI PRV SE. Let me expand this screen just a little bit so we can see a little bit more here. I've got a kickoff or a process start for WMI PRV SE.exe associated with Windows Management Instrumentation. And I can see all of the different metadata associated with this process. The command line that was executed, the hash, the memory usage, the parent details. There's also platform routing details. But more importantly, if I'm writing a detection rule for this, I'm going to be looking exactly for what was ran, where was it run from, what user was associated with that particular activity. Let's take a look at the corresponding event ID 1, the Sysmon event that corresponds with this as well. And I believe this is our event ID one. This is it right here. Notice we get a lot of the same context. I've got Sysmon running on this box specifically for this webinar. So I can see the differences between the two. And I can see a lot of the same context, a lot of the same details, command line information, command line arguments, parent process details. I have everything I need at this point to start to say, perfect. I can observe processes. I can start to write detections around process-oriented details or around process-oriented metadata. So I believe we should have our Atomic Red Team present in here as well. And I'm going to scroll down just a little bit here in my timeline. Notice that the timeline kind of format, the, uh, the you know the step-by-step -step timeline format, the second-by-second, -second, if you will, is the default telemetry representation for Lima Charlie. It makes this part super, super easy. But take a look around this window of activity right around here. Now, for anyone who's curious, the activity or the analysis that we're going through right now is actually one that is a very valuable step to go through. It is very close to what you would do in some sort of like an IR or a forensic investigation, which is I'm looking at windows of activity to see what has happened 
around this particular point in time? What has happened around when this occurred? And I'll tell you right now, we've already got something that we need to drill into a little bit further. So let's hover right around here. Now, I can go up here to my filter and I can do a quick, oh, it would help if I spelt it correctly. And I could go through and do a quick search for MSHTA, but I'm gonna actually wanna pivot over to my Atomic Red Team extension. And I'm gonna wanna say, did this thing run? Yes, it did. Our run started at 1723. It was obviously kicked off by me. I can see that this particular test ran and I can see that it also ran successfully. So guess what? I've got my time frame. Between 1723 and 1724 UTC is the time frame that I'm going to be interested in. Let's hop back over to our Windows box. 1723 to 1724. I've obviously been talking for a few minutes. So let's hop over to that particular time frame and we've got some fun activity going on right around this time here. Now there's a reason I am zooming in on this particular time frame. The big reason for that is because when I'm writing detections for living off the land binaries, I can't just roll in strong and say, all right, look for this one thing and it's bad. Look for these two things and it's bad. It's not that straightforward. Remember, this is a signed binary. This is a legitimate executable that is supposed to be there on the system. CMD.exe, if I hop back to my join guidance here, is one of the executables that they called out. Am I going to write a detection and response rule that says every time CMD.exe is fired, it is bad? Absolutely not. I would be throwing so many false positives through the line that my SOC, my security analyst, would not be able to keep up with it. Instead, I need to look around that activity. Temporal proximity is what this is called, and it's the best way to write high fidelity detection. Uh, sorry, high fidelity detections for things like living off the land binaries. And if hopefully those of you who have been kind of watching as I've been going through this, you can already see where our test kicked off or where our test took place, and it is right here. This is our Atomic Red Team test being run right in here. And I know that because the Atomic Red Team does a really good job of putting in the name of the technique that is being tested as this thing is being run. I'm a huge fan of seeing this. I'm a huge fan of seeing this because it allows me to see what happened in here. Now, let's go back and zoom in on, on this particular event here. It's the cmd.exe with that reference, that T1218.005 up above. And I want to see what happened when this particular thing ran. Now, I'm going to go through and do a couple of different steps here from an analysis perspective. But when I write detections, when I'm detection engineering and I want to find how do I go through and boil this down? How do I go through and write higher fidelity? I want to look at process chains. Telling me that cmd.exe is used maliciously is not enough to write that rule, as I said just a moment ago. I want to look at what happens when this particular thing occurs. What else is run? What else is run during this time? And within Lima Charlie, I'm able to build out this really, I'm not going to call it complex. It's just massive process chain of what happened during that time. But good Lord, look at all the things that lifted off when we did this. This is a lot of detail for us to dig through. So if I scroll down and let's see if I can't find one, I can already see that there was a particular PowerShell command that I think is probably related to the test itself being kicked off but I can start to see what that activity looks like. Perfect. By the way, I'm going to do something else in the background while I'm running through this, just to stimulate some additional activity in the background. All right. I think that we're going to be able to, there we go. Perfect. All right. I just kicked a little Easter egg off in the background there, but by focusing on the process tree, I'm able to go through and start to put together much more succinct, much more capable, detections. So I can look at my process tree and understand that flow. But as everyone saw, that scaled out really, really wide, really fast. So let's stick with our timeline. This might be our best, our best shot right here at going through and understanding what happened during this time. So I can see my cmd.exe process when this particular kicked off. Let's go ahead and start to scroll down through time. And we can see that in addition to this being launched, this cmd.exe, I can also see the execution of some additional cmd.exe parameters. I can see the calling of WMIC. 
looking to call in the local date time, likely also part of this test. I can see lots of references of cmd.exe with various command parameters being thrown after them. And then I can start to see the calls to things like WMIC, find.exe, and I can start to see that there's some network activity associated with this as well. It might not be related because this is an active system, but it's important to note what has happened, what has kicked off around this particular point in time. All right, we've got a starting point. We've got a starting point to say, is this particular instance, this calling of cmd.exe something malicious that I'm going to want to zoom in on, something that I'm going to want to maybe write a detection towards or apply some value towards? Let me actually go ahead and filter just on cmd.exe just so we can bring this thing back home. There we go. Up at the top, we've got our detection for cmd.exe T1218005. That is my atomic red team test being kicked off. Let's go ahead and start writing detection and response rules, knowing this is the thing that I'm looking for. Now, there's a couple ways to get here. First off, I could inside of the Lima Charlie platform if I wanted to. I'm going to bring up another window just so I can be over in this area here. And I went in light mode for this version. We're in two different versions of the same thing, but I went light mode on this one. I could go over to my detection and response rules and I could say, all right, I'm going to start looking for a brand new rule. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm gonna to start to copy over all these different values. Folks, we don't have time to go through all that. We just simply don't have time. Instead, we're going to use a little shortcut here inside of the platform that takes all the values in the event of interest and brings them over into a new window that I can start to use to write that detection and response rule. Hey, we're doing this inside of Lima Charlie. I want quick, fast ways to get towards results. I want value fast. If I go and run a test, purple teaming, red teaming, atomic red team, whatever it is inside of my environment, I want that turnaround quick. I want to be able to say I can write a detection and response rule for this thing in a matter of seconds or whatever it might be. But that being said, I got there fast. I was able to do that with a single mouse click and hopping over, but now we need to change things. So if you'll notice the default carryover from the detection and response or into the detection and response window includes the host name. I obviously don't want to include that. I want to get rid of having that host name in there because it is going to keep my detection focused on one particular system. And we don't want to have that in there. Now let's take a look at some of the other logic that get brought over. Now this is really good for helping me start the DNR rule, but it may be a little too restrictive in this case. For example, it did bring over the exact command line from a little bit earlier that was used in this particular test. Well, that would be good if I wanted to detect this activity. However, notice that there's a couple of things in here that are variable values. First off, this temp.bat file, which is part of the test, the atomic red team test that was brought down, this right here is a, a an ephemeral value. This could change. So if I focus on just this value right here, unfortunately, it is going to trigger just on the one event that we had because this value will likely change. And in fact, I'm going to come over here into, and I'm going to run that test one more time just to prove that point, just to say this is a thing that might actually get changed. So let's come back to our Windows 2016. I think it was 128.005, too many zeros there. There we go. We're going to run this test one more time just to see what happens. Perfect. Yep, we're good there. And I'm also going to run another test, which is going to be our bits jobs test, because it's one of my favorite ones to work through from a detection perspective. Perfect. All right. So we've got two tests running in the background, knowing what the syntax of that test is going to look like. I want to make some adjustments to these values right here. Maybe I don't want to pivot on this particular command line because I know that there's an ephemeral value in here. So what I'm going to do instead is I might change things up and I might say, instead of matching specifically, let me include the word contains. And I'm going to get rid of everything except the MITRE ATT&CK ID at the end of it. Now, hold on. Before any of you say this, you're like, wait, Matt, you're writing a detection rule for the atomic red team, not for the, the adversarial activity itself. I'm, I'm going to counteract that. And I'm going to say, no, not entirely. 
what I'm doing is I'm looking for areas inside of my detection and response rule that I can increase fidelity to find this particular thing. You can change these parameters to be whatever you want. So let's do this instead. Instead of looking for that atomic red team, let me insert the word evil.com or let me insert an IP address that my adversary was known to see. Uh, a.a.8. A. Maybe they're performing a DNS lookup or something like that. My point being, inside of Lima Charlie, I can get quickly to my detection and response rule. So now my time is spent on increasing fidelity by being aware of variability, being aware of what I can change and what I can't change. So I might go through and I might say again, T1218.005 is the thing that I'm going to look for in the command line because I want to detect this test, but I can modify that to be anything else I want, really. Let's go to MITRE ATT&CK matrix. And I said I wasn't going to mention this, and I'm not going to spend time walking through this, but I do want to come here. Let's do a quick search for uh, mshta.exe, which is one of the original things that we started looking through. And if I take a look and see how this particular tool has been used by various threat actors out there, you'll notice has been used to, has, has used MSHTA to execute malicious scripts, to execute DLLs, to execute a VB script, to load an HTA script within an LNK, to execute HTML pages. Do you see how it's not just one thing? Meaning I'm not just utilizing, or I should say the adversary is not just utilizing this tool in one negative way, in one malicious way. No, it's a whole variance. So my starting point to detect this has to be the binary itself. However, the command line is where I'm going to have to start to pivot a little bit. So I might insert the word contains in here and I might say, find me a process that is running cmd.exe is the file path and the command line is going to attain 1T1218.005. Again, my goal here is to look for some variability in the command line parameter because that's the part that's going to give me the most fidelity. Now, luckily, because of the way that Lehman Charlie functions, it brings that event over in there for you. And when I'm writing detection and response rules, and I zoomed all the way back out, you don't need to read this part, just follow me through the journey here. The way that I've written this detection and response rule, I can test it directly against the rule that, or I should say the event, the telemetry that just ran. So I can go ahead and run test event and take a look. It actually comes back with, here is where your detection and response rule was successful against that event. I love this part of writing detection and response rules inside of Lima Charlie. I love this part because it validates the thing that I was looking for. Let me recap. We kicked off a sample event using Atomic Red Team just to mimic what a living off the land execution might look like. Notice that our original focus was mshta.exe, but we panned over to cmd.exe just because that was the initial stage of the process there. What we did next is we brought that event over as a sample event, and I'm starting to write a detection and response rule to identify that particular event. Within the Lima Charlie platform, I'm able to quickly and easily see, yep, we're good to go. That thing fired, I've got a match. Now, of course, we could go the other route and we could say, all right, well, uh, let me see if there's other things in here that I could insert. Let me see if there's other parameters or qualifiers I could drop in here that might show me ways that adversaries have misused a particular thing. Where could I introduce some additional logic in order to account for this? And this is where it gets a little fun is I can, I can nest these rules in if I want to. And I'm going to type this out really quick here. And what this is going to let me do is it's going to let me start to embed certain rules in a nested format in here. And that's going to allow me to start to make much better logic decisions about what I'm looking for. So rather than an and, I might have an or. And this right here, folks, is where you're going to expand upon the ability to search across multiple different command line versions, meaning my adversaries are known for using these binaries in a bunch of different ways. Perfect. Let me write one detection and response rule that accommodates for those different ways that they might do something. So I might, for example, and I'm just going to easily copy and paste 
the efficient way of doing this. And I might come back here to joint guidance and I, I might say, okay, another technique that's being used is T1059. So I might drop that in as another parameter that I'm going to look for because I want to know, has this thing been running? Has this thing been executed in a MSHTA sense? Has it been executed in a CMD perspective? I have that binary as a starting point, but I'm able to use my operators and my nested logic to help me build out and expand that one rule. The flip side of this, or the thing that I see folks doing inside of the platform that I would definitely recommend not doing is writing a detection and response rule for every single version of what an adversary might do for every single variation. Oh, well, if they're going to use it to run a DLL, I'm going to write this rule. If they're going to use it to run a VB script, I'm going to write that rule instead. And I think you can consolidate a lot better. And I'll just make it really easy for everyone and show you exactly what I mean. Let's just do this instead. Let's go ahead and build this out. And I'm going to include the .hta in there, right? And what this does is it allows me to expand a rule to account for multiple variations of the same type of LOL activity while also serving as a qualifier. So that's one way to go about crafting these rules to make them a little bit easier and have a little bit higher, fidel higher fidelity in there. Because again, I can't come out of the gate and just write this. Unfortunately, it's going to fire way too much. Now, there's another variation in here that's worth knowing about when it comes to living off the land binaries, which is on Windows systems, at least Linux and Mac. This does not happen as much, but on it's possible, but it doesn't happen as much on Windows systems. There are multiple versions of the same binary in those environments. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to hop over to my uh, Windows 2016 server. By the way, it's super easy for me to just jump into a file system browser if I want and start to walk my way through the Windows directory. And the command.exe that we were focused on was in the one inside of System32. Remember, that one was pulled directly from the event that we had observed. If I go over to System32, if I, sorry, the folder, System32, I can see my, where's it at here? I'm going to scroll down through all of this mess. I could just do a quick filter. Maybe I'll just do a quick filter just to see. There's my cmd.exe, populated, perfect. That's the binary that we've been writing a detection and response rule for so far. Let me go up a directory though, just in case anyone's unfamiliar with this. There's another directory of interest in here, which is syswow64. This is my Windows on Windows. This is actually the 32-bit representation, but there's a cmd.exe in there as well. This has been covered in many other webinars and many capabilities, but one of the things, and I'm going to do a quick search here to see if it shows up. It does not. One of the things to be weary of when you're detecting for living off the land binaries is that you might have an adversary intentionally run a binary from the non-standard, or I should say unexpected location because they're looking to trip this up. They're looking to trip up a rule just like this. So as you're writing living off the land binary detection rules, you also want to be wary of where does that thing exist? And in this case, we might actually want to zoom out a little bit on the process details. There's two ways to go about this. I could, instead of saying, hey, only zoom in on the one in system 32, I could, if I want to do something like this. I could say the file path ends with cmd.exe. And what that's going to do is it's going to give me a really clear and straightforward, no matter where this thing is run from, as long as that file path ends in cmd.exe, we're good to go. That's going to help cover both of those directories that we talked about. And it might also account for if an adversary decides to copy cmd.exe to another location something that some adversaries will certainly do. Where this type of logic becomes a little bit uh, more necessary, in my opinion, is going to be in the in, in the context of like a Linux or a Mac OS, maybe not so much Mac OS, uh, but sometimes in Mac OS. Let me tell you why that is. In Linux and Mac OS environments, I can install certain tools or certain applications to almost any directory that I might want to, meaning I can say, hey, just install this thing globally and put it to the default, you know, user bin or, or S bin or, or wherever it might, you know, normally end up and whatnot. I could also roll in with my own version of curl 
or of wget which i believe were two tools that were called out uh, i know curl at least was definitely called out yeah curl was called out in this one as being um a place where you might want to be careful you know it might be a tool that adversaries will, will misuse i could roll in with my own copies of those and have them in specific locations so for for linux and windows and mac specifying a little bit of a variable of a file path is going to be another way to increase some fidelity because it's going to allow you to pivot through the different versions that might be on a system. The other one that I want to call out here, and I find this to be an interesting focus, but they also called out that the adversaries are known for utilizing Python, Perl, and Ruby scripts in Windows and Uni Windows or Unix environments. When it comes to writing living off the land detections for these types of scripts, you have two places to work from. You have the interpreter itself being run, and then the script that was called. You can take a shot in the dark and say, well, between those two, which one do you think is probably more static? As I'm writing a detection and response rule, I want the one that's more static, that's more stable. And that's going to be the actual interpreter itself. But the same rules apply. If I go and install Python on a Windows system, I can install that Python anywhere I want. In fact, in the setup and installation menu, it even says, where would you like to install this thing? If I go and I'm on a Linux machine and I install Python locally, I can put it in a local hidden folder. Some adversaries will go through and do that, or I can just install it using a package manager, which will put it in the default location. My point remains, though, as I'm going through and conjunction, uh, constructing these detection and response rules, I want to be aware of the variability in the path location. Let's go ahead and kind of put a little bit of, of additional practice into play here. So... Just to recap everything thus far, we started out understanding our joint guidance and relating that over to my detection and response rules and my atomic red team to help me quickly trigger events that I can use to model detection rules off of. Okay. I went through and I ran as we were kind of talking through this, and it was definitely a few minutes ago, but I'm going to go back to my atomic red team and I'm going to see that I also ran a bits jobs test, which is going to be one, one, nine, seven. I went ahead and ran a bits jobs test inside of the environment because I want to see what happened. It looks like our test was run around 1737, 1738. So I'm going to go back to our timeline and I'm going to see around that time frame what has happened. So 1737, 38, looks like I've been talking for a minute. Let's make life a little bit easier for us. Let's see if there's any bits admin that we get inside of here. And interestingly enough, I've got some, oh, this is because I was digging my way through the uh, the system directories there. Of course it was. What was it? Was it 1197, I think? Perfect. So there is our, let me see if that was the, I believe that was, yeah, T1197. There's our, our time frame of interest as well. So I can see, and I'm going to try and zoom in and find when this particular one happened. Let's see, 37 or 38. And hang tight. I am way back in time. We want to be up here for today. All right. I've got a really noisy UDP event in here that's making life very interesting as I try to go through and, and search through this. All right, perfect. I think we've got some event execution happening right around this period right here. First off, I can see some of the atomic red team things being kicked off, number one. Two, I can see uh, reconnaissance commands or I can see sort of information gathering commands such as host name, who am I, and whatnot being called out. I can see a lot of associated process events. There's a test that was run off. Ah, okay. We've got a really interesting one here, which looks like I've got another test that kicked off in the background, and it was a phishing attachment test that ran as well as part of this, which I'm always a fan to see because I like running more tests at one time than I can. But nonetheless, let's hop into that particular one right here. And there we go. Do, 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 new document being created. I want that process event that's associated with that. And I'm going to look through... By the way, if you're watching me walk through this and you're kind of like, oh my gosh, Matt, I know exactly what it feels like to just be kind of walking my way through a system timeline. Folks, this is where I want you to be as you're going through and writing these detection and response rules. I want you to be walking your way through the telemetry inside of that system so that you understand what happened, what kicked off at that time. 
I'm going to be honest and say, it looks like I kicked off a whole bunch of tests. I might've done a category selection, which kicked a whole bunch of things off at once, which is great because it created a whole stream of telemetry for me to dig through. And I'm actually happy to see all this in here because as I'm scrolling, look at all these events, look at all these things that happen, shell scripts being kicked off, bat files being downloaded, all sorts of wonderful categories. This was a very happy accident. That I'm a big fan of, but let me pick on this one right here because it is, I want, I want, I want this one right there. There we go. Let's talk about this particular test right here. Let's talk about detecting the actual atomic red team activity happening here. I'm going to hop over to detection and response rule so we can dig into this one a little bit further. Whew. First off, when we're writing, when we're going through and modifying rules, let's go through and make a quick change and get rid of that host name specification as I just talked about. And I'm going to zoom in here and I'm going to look through what types of things were called as that particular one was run. Now, this is a multi-line command. It's being represented for us in a multi-line capacity. I'm not interested in any of that. I want this little call right here. I'm going to get rid of everything else. We're going to change this over to a contains. And that's how I'm going to go through and modify that rule. I'm looking for instances of PowerShell.exe in which the invoke ATH HTML application call has been made. And I'm going to use that to pivot on that particular event. I'm going to run it against my test event. Do I have a match? Yes, I do. Boom. We've got something a little sturdy there. I'm going to hop back to my timeline because, again, you know me. I'm going to continue to dig through my telemetry. And I'm going to see what else is kicked off at that time. I'm super glad that we had this happen, actually, because it, it was great to see all this telemetry pop up and fill up because it gives me a lot of stuff to go dig through. I'm going to turn this UDP event off because it's just polluting all of my uh, different, uh, all, all, all of my telemetry here, but we'll focus just on process events. There we go. Now, I'm going to make a quick change to this. We've got a few minutes left in this webinar here. I spent a lot of time going through looking at different process events, but I want to take my detection and response rules and I want to expand them a step further. Maybe the telemetry that I'm interested in is not so much EDR process events, but maybe I'm looking across Windows event logs. Maybe I'm looking at those as a particular source of evidence for this type of activity. Now, we do know that Windows event ID 1 in the Sysmon context, by the way, Sysmon logs are the only ones I'm ingesting right now. If you're ingesting security event logs, it's going to be 4688s. But the Sysmon event ID 1 is going to be my new process creation. I'm going to zoom in on just PowerShell.exe. I'm going to use my filter as a quick keyword search here. I'm going to zoom out and scroll over just so I can start to kind of scroll my way and navigate through this telemetry to see what happened. And whew, these are really, really busy logs. This is a lot of stuff for us to look through here. Let me see if I don't by any chance have maybe some sort of uh, MITRE attack ID or something that I can pivot off of to help me kind of zoom in a little bit further on the events of interest. And it looks like I do. I've got a lot of different events kicked off based on that particular attack ID. So I'm going to drop this filter in here one more time. Now I know I'm looking for MITRE attack ID, but there we go. There's my Windows event log entry, my Sysmon event entry for the execution of our temp.bat that we saw a little bit earlier. Same exact rule applies, but take a look how things have changed. In this case, I'm going to need to have a little bit more fidelity in the way I build that rule out. So I've got a Windows event log event right here kicked off. But look at the rule that came over. All it did was it pivoted on rule event ID number one. Well, folks, if we insert this into our SOC analysis or in our detection stream here, we are going to be throwing so many false positives because that is every single process execution that kicks off. So in this case, and let me bring up my system timeline here, jumped over into light mode for you just to get some folks paying attention. Let me go back and zoom in on my WELs, 1218.005. And we're going to see, let me see, oh, my time frame is too small. That's why we're going to go back to around my time frame of interest, which I think should be somewhere, hopefully around here. There we go. Perfect. So there is my MSHTA being run. There's the actual test that we saw as part of the 1218.005. I believe that keyword is probably going to carry through from the parent command line. But nonetheless, there's our bat file. I want to look through some of the values here to find things I can use for some additional pivoting. Just in the way that I went through and I wrote that new process detection and response rule, 
I want to go through and say, what inside of this Windows event log entry could I use for some additional pivoting as well? And there's a couple things of value. The first one might be, once again, to focus on the command line itself. So I'm going to build this in to my detection and response rule. It's going to be event, event data, command line. Notice we've already got this in here. So I'm going to drop in. My rules are going to be and. Apologies on my keyboard here. I'm going to type this out, right? We're going to have our operator of contains, just as we did before. We're going to have a path of event. Oh, let's stop putting in spaces where we don't need them. Event, event, slash. And I'm going to go back and modify this out. Event, event, uh, data, data. And instead of the, that's going to be command line, all one word. Let me drop back in here. Command line, all in one word. And my value in this case is going to be T1218.005. So let's recap what's happened here. Here's our original event. We modeled this event out as part of our Atomic Red team using the new process event. We're now gonna look at it from a Windows event log perspective, but I wanna pivot on the same types of values. I wanna apply the same type of logic. What thing will give me enough fidelity that I can match on this particular event However, I don't want to be restricted to just this one. I want to have a little bit of flexibility in here, but I also don't want to throw a ton of false positives. This is one way to go about it with using the Windows event logs, using the Sysmon event log IDs, is to look for process execution, just like we had before, and then pivot on that one keyword. But does anyone notice a quick issue here? I didn't specify what is doing the execution. Oddly enough, up to this point, all we've done is say, this is a process execution event. All of this text right here just mimics the words new underscore process. Unfortunately, we didn't actually get anywhere yet. So the only qualifier that I have built in, the only thing that I'm searching for inside of that process context is that keyword. T1218.005. Now I could go a step further and I could say, let's boil this out to be mshta.exe and maybe that's going to be a better approach. Again, that is not what we're looking for. Let me go here and insert that. All I've done is I've taken basically the same new process rule that I had from before, which I think will be up here. Let me see this one right here. And I've gotten rid of all the qualifier values. That rule is the same as this right here, these two rules. Pivoting on a process execution and looking for cmd.exe and looking for cmd.exe. Both of those rules get me to the same place. We need to have the additional context in there. The one that says, this is the thing of value that we're looking for. When you're going through and you're detecting living off the land binaries, you need to have that additional what else. What else could qualify this as a bad tool, could qualify this as a malicious usage of that particular tool? Let me see if I can find an example of CMD. Perfect. There we go. They go through and they talk about look for things like this. Look for things like using the type command or using the type pattern in order to create alternate data streams and things like that. Those would be really good qualifiers to drop in. As I'm going through and examining that telemetry, as I'm going through and examining those events that have kicked off in my environment, I want to look for those little qualifiers that help me say, this is an event of interest beyond a doubt, because it mimics exactly what I might see that adversary do. Now, I'm a couple minutes over on here, and I'm okay with that because we did start a couple minutes behind, but I want to wrap this up for everyone. This may have felt like a little bit of an abstract webinar, kind of like, wait, Matt, how come we didn't just go through and just write detection rules for the 50 different things that adversaries can do? Because if we just wrote the rules without understanding how we go through writing rules, we're not going to get anywhere in what the next rule looks like. Showing you how to write 20 doesn't help you write 21. I want to write one with a lot of fidelity and write it really well so that the next hundred are easy to go through. One of the ways that we go through testing telemetry and testing out the platform in Lima Charlie is to utilize the atomic red team extension that we've got built in. Now I could talk at length about how valuable these are to have, but I like them for the purpose that we just use them for, for the past hour, kicking off an event and then using it to analyze telemetry. 
I'm not in the command line inside of this virtual machine fumbling around hoping to run the right command. Folks, when I'm writing a detection and response rule, and I see the question that came through, I'll get there in just a moment. When I'm writing a detection and response rule, my goal is not to perfectly mimic the adversary running the command. It's to detect the execution of that command. So I'm going to make an argument and say, I want the telemetry so I can start to examine the telemetry. We took a look at two forms of it. We started with process events. We looked at new process. And then we looked at process execution inside of Windows event logs as well. Oddly, not oddly, but perfect segue. There was a question that just came through that said, would you recommend combining the event types, new process and WEL in the same detection and response rule and maybe nest them in an operand for detection capabilities? I would say if you have a reliable source of fidelity that you want to trust, you could certainly go that route. However, I would only use that in very small niche cases like this thing is 100% bad. So I'm going to capture it every single which way. The or command allows you to say, hey, if it's a process or if it's a Windows event log or if it's this or if it's that. However, that's not really the approach I would, I would recommend going through because if I have one telemetry source in place, then I'm going to have the other. So what I would recommend doing instead is I would recommend alternating between your telemetry sources based on the information that you're looking for, based on the thing that you're looking to pivot through. New process events in Lima Charlie are going to capture pretty much every other value that you're going to find in process execution events. It's going to be almost one for one with Sysmon event ID ones. It's going to be more than 4688s. So it's going to be a really reliable foundation to have. Now, let me go back to my Windows event ID here, uh, my event IDs. Let me take a look and show you where there might be an area for you to pivot on it a little bit further. And we're going to come back to our time frame of interest. We're going to go for T1218.005. Let me hop back over here. And I am going to zoom up to our new process event which we've already covered kind of at length in this one right here. And that's going to be my CMD running that particular bat file. All right, here we go. Notice in this case right here, when it comes to things like the parent information, I do get some insight as to like the parent command line that was run, the parent process ID and things like that. If I take a look at the exact same Sysmon event, I data, uh, event data, I get pretty much the same amount of detail in here. Where I do get a little bit of differenti differentiation, which might be good for your detection and response rules, is going to be in some cases where I might get uh, additional metadata about the parent, or I might get things like the parent user. So if I was looking through process trees or process cascades as my detection capability, that's where I might lean a little bit more on the detect on the event log because it might have those built in. Whereas simple process execution, command line arguments and things like that, I'm gonna be focused on just a new process event, but you could certainly chain those together if you wanted to. With that said, today's webinar was meant to kind of start to plant the seeds and a little bit of foundation about writing detection and response rules for folks. As I mentioned, detection and response rule writing should really begin with telemetry. Should really begin with, okay, I can see and observe this event. So let me start to write let me start to craft a detection for this particular event. I wanted to introduce the paradigm of this thing might be legitimate, Matt. So when do I actually, how do I go through and detect it? And it's going to be in the variability of the command. The other thing we talked about was understanding that sometimes in an operating system, binaries can be located in different locations. So make sure you account for that as well. Now, this has been a really fun webinar, primarily because I've got to spend a lot of time digging through telemetry. As a final note for everyone here, uh, when you're writing rules inside of Lima Charlie, you have as much flexibility and openness as you want. When you're writing them, make sure to utilize that kind of look back capability that's built in from that target event that gets brought over. Make sure you utilize that to your advantage because it's a quick way to go through and test and validate. It, did what I write detect the thing that actually occurred? And I promise you, the more time you spend going through and walking through this iterative process of what does my telemetry show? How can I modify my rule? Let me increase for fidelity. You're going to have a lot better time constructing rules, and it's going to end up being a lot more uh, a quicker and more repetitive process for you. 
With that said, everyone, it's Matt over here at Lima Charlie. This was meant to be a, a fairly technical deep dive into what it's like to write a detection and response rule. We utilized LOL bins or living off the land binaries as an example. However, detecting malware, malicious activity, and things like that should always constitute layers of approaches to help maximize fidelity and minimize false positive. With that said, I hope to see you all on our next webinar. Today was fun. If you have any questions, feel free to jump into our community Slack at uh, slack.limacharlo.io. Fire them away, and I'll be happy to answer anything and everything I can. With that said, I'll hopefully catch you on the next webinar. All right, everyone. Take care. Thank you.